There was a moment when I had a cold. It's the first time it ever happened to me. And it was so bad, I couldn't smell and I couldn't taste. My world collapsed. I cried every day. I got up in the morning and I had a, a cinnamon stick in my pocket and I would try to smell it every few hours because it was like I, everything went to black and white. I just couldn't be me in the world without my sense of smell and taste. I tried chopping a garlic clove and there was nothing and all the joy was gone. Welcome to Sounds Like Portraits. I'm Philip Ungar. This is a podcast with creative humans. In this episode, you'll hear Melissa Clark, who's a food writer and a columnist for the New York Times, talking about her creative process. I sat with her around a small table in the kitchen. She told me that food is her real connection to people. What does she really need to start writing a delicious recipe? Her answer is desire. Creativity comes from desire. It's time to listen to her. But before, she told me what she tried to do all her life. All my life, I've always tried to make people love me by feeding them. That is my connection to people. When I was a teenager, I became a, the popular girl in the class when I started baking brownies and handing them out. Before that, it was a little bit rough. But as soon as I realized that if you bake people something, then, hey, they want to hang out with you. They want to sit next to you. You're the girl with the chocolate chip cookies in her bag. And that identity became um, very powerful to me. You know, it was a way to... It was a way to meet people. It was a way to connect with people. But it also led to... It led to discussions about, you know, something that I was obsessed with. I was obsessed with baking at that point, and I met other people who were too. So it was fun to be able to say, oh, well, what if we try black pepper in the brownies? Or what if we, you know, added dried cranberries to the chocolate chip cookies? You know, it was... Um, I always felt so strange being the kid who was obsessed with food. And then, you know, when you start meeting like-minded people, your world opens up in a really profound way. What's the difference between being obsessed with food and being passionate about food? We've been in a moment for a while of food being an accepted obsession. You know, it's okay to be passionate about food. Everybody is. But when I was a kid, this wasn't the case. I mean, if you were, you, there was no, the word foodie didn't exist when I was growing up. It was weird. Why would you think so much about food? So there's always been a little bit of stigma attached to it. I mean, now it's gone, thank God. Um, and now when I see little kids, you know, kids who are my daughter's age, 10, 11, 12, cooking and obsessed with it and talking to each other about flavor, I think, gosh, it's so different. And I love it. I love seeing it because, you know, taste is so essential. It's so primal. And I love to see that that is something that they can share with one another. You know, when you're a kid, there's only so many different ways you can connect. You know, you, you talk about, I don't even know what they talk about. They talk about, you know, my daughter's friends talk about books and they talk about TV shows and they talk about video games. And these are also, um, they're not sensual. You know, they're not part of your being. And to commune about food just seems much deeper. What did you learn about cooking from your holidays in France when you were a little girl? When my parents took my sister and me to France when we were kids, it was like entering a paradise. It was like going through this gate of another world because that's where everybody was actually obsessed with food. We weren't the freaks on the block. You know, everybody was doing it. Everybody was at the market. I'd never seen a farmer's market before I went to France. I had never seen the kind of loving care, kind of um, shown to a tomato <laughs> until I went there. You know, you saw people looking at every potato, picking it up, turning it around. You know, I was used to supermarkets, so this was a shock. And, you know, we, my family joined the ranks of the shoppers. We joined the ranks of the, the people cooking. We went to markets. Our French wasn't great, but it was good enough. You know, we could get by and we could order our, our meals in restaurants. And, um, you know, and it's funny because when I think about my French, I always say, well, I speak food French just fine. And I can read any menu, but, you know, try to talk to me about politics and I don't have the language. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this shaped me. It gave um, a validity to what I wanted to do. Um, and I saw everybody else was doing it too. So that was important. We started going to France before I can even remember. You know, it was always part of my life. But there was a point where the food thing became a conscious, it became consciously part of my life. And I think I was around 
eight. And I think that's when I really started becoming interested in flavors and in tastes. You know, before that, it was all, you know, pain au chocolat and ice cream. And then it became something else. And that's when every year when we went, I started to really understand the difference between French food culture and American food culture and the lack of what we have here. And I'm happy to say that that lack is a lot less pronounced now. But there was a difference. It was a, it was a door. Every trip was a passing through a door. Where were you exactly in France? In the south, in the west, in the north? We went all over France. We exchanged our house in Brooklyn. We lived in Flatbush, Brooklyn. And um, my parents were psychiatrists, which meant they had all of August off. And so every August, we, you know, we would, this is before the internet, so we would write letters to people we didn't know all across France and propose that they would come to Brooklyn and we would stay in their house. And this was... Uh, Brooklyn in the late 70s, early, really, I guess really the 80s, and it was not like it is now, you know. It was scary, it was rough, people didn't know where to go, you know, and um, it was frightening for a lot of, you know, a lot of the French people just weren't used to that kind of gritty urban experience, and we would go to these bucolic little towns in the middle of, you know, in, in Provence, and in Brittany, in, in um, Normandy, and we would have, you know, we'd eat camembert, and You know, we hoped that they found the bagels, but, you know, we left them lists, but you never know. Melissa, what do our food choices say about us? How do you see that? Our food choices can say a lot about us or very little. Depends on the person. I don't know. I don't judge people by their food choices necessarily. I don't think we should. Um, I think health plays a lot into it. I wish people would make food choices because they were doing two things. They were listening to what their body tells them feels good, you know, they're, I think everybody understands their own personal health, you know, and so when if I say, oh, this is healthy, this is healthy food, or the government says this is healthy food, I actually don't believe that that's necessarily true for everyone. So I wish people would choose what they know makes them feel good. Also, what makes them feel happy, what gives them delight. And if they can do those two things, then I think that if everybody was thinking about food that way and choosing food With those two criteria, I feel like we'd have a healthier, less obese, more vibrant society, you know, across the United States. And I just don't know that we're taught to do that. I think we're, I think people don't listen to themselves and they don't, and we eat so unconsciously so much of the time, so. Is there something you refuse to eat? The only thing I won't eat, I won't eat sunchokes, Jerusalem artichokes. They make me ridiculously sick. And um, in fact, they make a lot of people sick and people don't even necessarily know that there's a, a chemical in sunchokes called inulin and it causes digestive distress. So um, if you've ever felt a little weird after eating some roasted vegetables, you might think about asking if there was sunchokes in the mix. Cooking or not cooking, that's, um, that's the question today because cooking is very time consuming. You're um, a working mom. How do you do to cook every day for your family? People think cooking is more time consuming than it is. It doesn't have to be time consuming. I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to cook, you know, to cook in this way that doesn't make sense with our lifestyles. You know, to cook this kind of 1950s meal of a, you know, meat and two sides and like that's the only thing that counts as dinner. I think if you cook one thing and if you just cook something simple, it's so much better than anything you can order in. And I wish people would just give themselves a break. I know for me, you know, for me it's different. When I cook for my family, like that's my happy time. I, I want to cook. Cooking, I always say that cooking dinner at night is my daily dose of weekend. You know, it's a joy. Um, and I make it a joy. I make it the happiest part of my day. Put on music. I You know, my husband opens the wine, we are sit together as a family, we're all in the kitchen together, and I love it, but not everybody feels that way. And so I always say that if you like to cook on the weekends, you know, and you generally like to cook, then find a way to make that cooking during the week feel just as good. You know, even if you're just making one small thing, maybe you're just making a salad dressing and you've bought the greens and they're already washed and you're grating your garlic and you're squeezing your lemon and whisking it in with a little mustard and some olive oil and that's all you cook, that's enough. But enjoy that process. And if you don't want to cook, then don't cook. You know, you don't have to. There, there are so many choices. But if you like it even a little, then I say try to like it. Just give yourself permission, give yourself the time to not make it this time-consuming chore at the end of the day. Make it a 
happy moment at the end of the day. Do you have some tips to help beginners to start cooking without disaster? Beginners like me. I think beginner cooks should just start with one simple thing. Well, first of all, start with something you love to eat because there's no point in cooking something if you're just like, eh, I don't really, I don't really want to eat this at the end, you know. But uh, I think one of the easiest things if if you love roasting anything, vegetables or meat, I feel like it's the easiest recipe. And just take the thing that you love. Say that you love. What do I love? I love potatoes. Everybody loves potatoes, right? Who doesn't love a potato? So you take your potatoes, cut them into bite-sized pieces so you can eat them easily later. Put them in a pan, put some kind of oil on them, whatever you have. Olive oil, if you've got some duck fat in the fridge, then you're probably not a beginner, but uh, maybe you have even just vegetable oil, whatever you have, and some salt, and that's it. Three things, fat, potatoes, salt, and then put it in your oven. And you can decide how hot your oven is gonna be by how hungry you are. Are you really hungry? Then turn it up. Cut the pieces small, they'll be done quicker. Do you have more time? Cut the pieces a little bit bigger and go a little slower. Um, I always start roasting around 400. So somewhere between 400 and 450 is your sweet spot. And then just let them go. And then when you smell them, they're ready. Or at least they're they're beginning to be ready and then you can toss them a little bit. And um, level two, add some some herb sprigs to the roasting pan, add some garlic cloves to the roasting pan. But just start with those three things, potatoes, fat, and salt, and add a little heat. And you know what? Roasted potatoes, fantastic. I'm happy because I'm already at the level two. (laughs) Good. Well, we'll get you to level three. Level three is when you take your chicken and you put them on top of your potatoes and you roast that too. Melissa, how would you define what a disaster is in cooking? The only disasters in cooking are the things you absolutely can't eat. And even that's not a disaster because you've learned from it. So say that you make something and you take your potatoes and your oil and your salt and you put it in the oven and then you fall asleep and you forget. And then billowing smoke comes out and you have to throw it out. Okay, maybe you've learned to set the timer (laughs) when you start cooking. Or maybe you make something and you add, you know, too much garlic and you're, oh. So okay, you've learned. You know, maybe you like a little bit less. Just... Think about cooking as a learning process and don't think of it as a failure, you know, think of it as, you know, I read this article that said your brain expands every time you make a mistake. So just think of it as your brain's getting bigger. That's good news. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Uh, You know, I always tell my daughter that, you know, your brain's getting bigger. It doesn't matter. And so the same thing, you're getting to be a better cook. Every time you burn something, every time you drop something, every time you over season or under season you're becoming a better cook about following a recipe do you strictly follow the recipe or do you add something that comes to mind i rarely follow a recipe unless i'm testing it and when i'm testing i have to be very meticulous and i have to weigh and measure everything I hate it. (laughs) I always hire recipe testers to help me because that is not my comfort zone. I like to just cook. I like to just, you know, poke things and push things and add some of this and add some of that. I like to go through my fridge and use up all those little containers of leftovers. My husband says, how did you make this? These beans are so delicious. I said, well, I took that piece of pork that you had left over from dinner last night at the restaurant that you took in the takeout container, and I chopped that up fine, and I rendered out all the fat. And then I also added some chipotle chilies because I had one left in a little container, and it was bothering me. And then I added my beans, and then I added you know, this and that, and it goes on. And then at the end of it, I tasted it, and I thought, this needs something. This needs, this needs brightness and life. And so I had a Seville orange which is really hard to find. You can only get them in February, you know, January, February, and only rarely. And I had a little piece of it left and I squeezed it on top. So that's nobody's recipe. And you know what? No one can make that recipe. I can't even write that recipe down because I can't say, well, you know, go to Romans on DeKalb Avenue, order the pork belly, take a piece home, start there. And by the way, that little piece of Seville orange, use that at the end. So cooking is all about creativity. Cooking can be about creativity. Cooking can be about letting yourself go and using what's around you. And that's my, that's the fun part. That's the creative part. But it's also, it, you know, it can also be, you don't have to be creative. You can also take, I mean, is it creative to take your potatoes and add olive oil and salt and put them in the oven? It doesn't, it can be or it doesn't have to be. It, it's up to you. It's up to the person cooking. How do you go about creating a recipe? 
I create recipes starting from what I want to eat or what somebody I want to feed wants to eat. I start from desire. So creativity comes from desire. I try really hard to listen to actually what I'm hungry for. I think that's important. You know, what do I really want? You know, I should have, you know, the sautéed fish. I really want something with melted cheese all over it. I want the cheese to turn brown at the edges. And, and I go from there and I think, well, how do I combine those things? Because I really should eat that, you know, there's a piece of fish in my, I've got this hake, got it at the farmer's market, I really should use it. But oh, that melted cheese, is there a way to bring those two elements together? Or I'll start from, okay, I make my husband beans, he loves beans, how do I make them interesting? Or I make my daughter, you know, she loves a grilled cheese sandwich, what can I do so I don't go crazy with boredom? And also I want to push her. I want her to try new flavors. So if I take the grilled cheese sandwich, right, which I know she loves, what's the thing I can sneak in there that maybe she's not so sure she loves and maybe push her to try something new? Maybe it is cumin flavored mustard. You know, maybe I put a little bit of that on the bread or maybe I give her some pesto on the side. Like, hey, you want to try dunking? You know, so, um, so how do I create a recipe? I don't think about it too hard. I just do it. Are you sometimes inspired by other recipes? I'm always inspired by recipes. I'm always inspired by ingredients. I'm inspired by restaurant menus. You know, even for food I haven't eaten, I can read things and I can think, well, how is that chef going to do that? You know, how are they going to put rutabaga with, um, you know, with raspberries? I don't see it. But then I think, well, okay, but maybe I should try it. I'm inspired by color. You know, I mean, I'll look around and I'll want to put, you know, I I want my food to be beautiful. So if I'm cooking something very brown, I think, well, how can I, how do I make, add a shape or a color that's going to bring it and make it beautiful? I'm inspired by, um, you know, I, I listen to music all the time when I cook, and I don't know that it directly affects my recipes, but I do feel like there are slow recipes. There are classical music recipes and opera recipes, and they're different from pop tunes or you know show music or sort of livelier more up-tempo things I think sweets are the up-tempo things I think yeah I don't know maybe no it switches I'd have to I'd have to really think about that but I know that I know that music is part of that too why is food a powerful vehicle for storytelling because you're a writer food is my metaphor it's how I relate to the world it's how I see people and talk to people I can tell them something about it. I can teach people. <laughs> it's very, you know, it's, maybe it's just, this, you know, very sort of infantile in a way to see the world by tasting, right? You know, this is an infantile um, phase that we go through that maybe I'm stuck in. But to me, it's like the world, I want to taste everything in it. There was a moment when I had a cold. My cold, it's the first time it ever happened to me. And it was so bad, I couldn't smell and I couldn't taste. My world collapsed. I cried every day. I mean, it was terrible. I couldn't, I I got up in the morning and I had a a cinnamon stick in my pocket and I would try to smell it every few hours because it was like everything went to black and white. I I just couldn't be me in the world without my sense of smell and taste. You know, smell and taste are so linked. I tried chopping a garlic clove and there was nothing and all the joy was gone. Food is the only way I can tell a story. I don't know how to live without it. I don't know how to be a person in the world unless I have that at, to bring my color and my life. How did you learn to write about food? I started writing about food at pretty much as soon as I started writing. Like that was food was always a character. Even when I was a kid, food was a character. I remember writing this for the for one of the first stories I ever wrote when I was a little kid was about pumpkins. You know, it was about Halloween, it was a Halloween story, it was a horror story, it was about, you know, scary story. But the pumpkins were very much part of it. And to me, the pumpkins were not just this Halloween thing, they were actually food. So even then, it was this way of um, conveying plot. But then I started developing it quite purposefully when I decided I wanted to be a food writer. And I had read MFK Fisher. I think every food writer who starts out reads MFK Fisher. She was a Californian. She started writing, I think, in the 30s and 40s. She was interesting for a lot of reasons. She took food seriously. She took food as a subject seriously. It was something worthy of writing. You know, she came from an academic background, and food was something intellectual as well as sensual, and she wrote about it like that. But she also was a woman... And um, 
it was interesting because before MFK Fisher, men did most of the writing about gourmet food. They were the bon vivants. They were writing about the fighter things in life. They were the editors of Gourmet Magazine. And women were just writing recipes, and it was completely different. And she kind of bridged that gap between the male intellectual food writer and the home economist who was writing, you know, recipes for, you know, thrifty pudding and, you know, inexpensive things to eat during wartime. And she did it with style and she did it with narrative, telling stories. So she was a writer and she was a thinker and she was an eater. And I thought, well, I want to do all those things too. So I started reading her very seriously and kind of watching, studying how she did it. You know, how did she do it? And, I, you know, it's the kind of thing I don't think you can learn it. I think it just sort of gets stuck in the back of your brain. You know, all that stuff that you are exposed to when you're young, it's like stuck back there. And it comes, I mean, I hope it comes out. So writing a recipe is telling a story. Writing a recipe can be telling a story. It depends on how you write it. Reading a recipe can be reading a story. It depends on what you bring to it, you know. I bring my own stories, and I hope people then bring their own stories too. You know, it's sort of like a meeting of two stories when I write the recipe and then someone cooks the recipe. That's really, you know, if you think about it, how powerful is that? I mean, it's one thing for you to write a book and someone to read your book and think about your book, but they're cooking. You know, I'm actively cooking and someone is actively cooking back. I think that is an incredible way to communicate with people. And it happens all the time. I'll walk down the street and someone says, I'll ma I made your recipe. And I couldn't be happier. I mean, I really feel like I've made a friend in that moment, you know? It's like, oh, you did? And I always want to talk about it. You know, well, how did it come out? What did you do? Did you do anything different? What did you do? And I love hearing that. Do you have guidelines in your food writing? Uh, when, yeah, when I write, recipe writing is very formulaic. You know, it's very formulaic. You start with the ingredients, and then you write the procedure. And you have to, because you have to keep track of everything. In fact, when I take notes, if I'm writing, if I'm creating a recipe, you know, in the kitchen, I'm working, I have a notebook, and I write down what I do so that I then later go type it up. And I, half the time, I just write down the ingredients. I know what I'm going to do with them. And it's just keeping track of how much salt and how many garlic cloves. So that's where I start. I start with the ingredient list, and then I go to the technique, and then I go back to the ingredient list and refine it and, you know, it, it is very technical in a way. It's like, okay, well, do I want to write four garlic cloves minced or do I want to give people the instructions for mincing within the recipe itself? And it depends on how specific I want to be about how the thing should be minced. So there are little micro decisions I'm making without uh, even thinking about making them. But in the end, I'm trying to be concise. I'm trying to be super clear. I'm trying to anticipate anybody else's problems along the way so that when they cook, they're going to come up with something as delicious as I want them <laughs> to come up with. Does writing inform how you cook? No, my writing and my cooking, those things are separate. I don't think about how I'm going to write the recipe when I'm doing it. It doesn't matter. The creation of the recipe and the creation of the story behind the recipe are two very, very separate things. Sometimes they have nothing to do with each other. Sometimes I'm creating a recipe and I won't even write the story about it until, you know, months later. And I'm in a completely different place. And so the story tangentially has to do with the recipe, but isn't the, necessarily the story of the recipe. They're both stories of something having to do with a larger story, you know, the larger narrative. They, they both have to do with a larger narrative, but they're not necessarily of a piece. And sometimes I'll create a recipe and it's very specific to a story. I need to tell the story about these clams because when I bought the clams, this thing happened. I can't even remember. You know, I went to Sheepshead Bay and And along the way, I thought this thing, and I remembered my uncle or whatever it is, and there's a specific reason for the story and the recipe to be together. But then sometimes I'm writing about roasted tomatoes with anchovy breadcrumbs, and I made it last summer, and boy, was it good, and I'm writing about it now, and it's the middle of the winter, and uh, I haven't had it in months, but I still have something to say. I just don't have to say now what I had to say then. You wrote books with culinary legends like Daniel Boulou, mm -hmm. uh, David Bully, and some others. What is a great chef for you? I think a great chef is someone who does the things I'm not thinking of. I love that. I love learning. I love a chef who has a lot of technique and a lot of thinks about food differently from the way I do. So to me, a great chef and a great meal is 
I wouldn't have thought of that. And wow, did you do that well? That, that intersection between, you know, just being so different. But then sometimes, I mean, then there are great chefs who do exactly what I would do, but I don't have to do it. That's great too. I guess there's two different ways of being a great chef, but it's, um, it's the combination of creativity and technique. You know, you have to have both. You must, must know how to make your vision on the plate come alive and it has to work. If they can do that, if they can actually do that and make me think, wow, then that's great. I'm gonna leave the kitchen, your kitchen. Please hold the microphone and add whatever you want to the interview. Waiting for him to go. So you see, yeah, he's still going. So this is what you don't know that I'm gonna tell you. We did this interview before. I'm doing this again because there was a problem with the equipment. And I don't think I said one thing the same that I said last time. I think everything was different. I don't know, Philippe will have to weigh in here, but I just have, does that mean that I'm completely schizophrenic? I'm two different people? Or does that mean that, God, people are so changeable and different. And this was, you know, I was, I was annoyed that I had to do this again because I did this already, but I'm also I was sort of excited to do it again too because I was curious, would he ask the same questions and would I say the same things? And I can pretty much guarantee that there's nothing the same. So yay, here's to change, right? Okay, I'm gonna let him come back in now. All right, I'm done. Thank you, Melissa Clark, for sharing your story. It was Sounds Like Portraits, a podcast by Philippe Ungar. Music, Charmeuse de Serpent, composed and conducted by Olivier Glisson. See you soon for the next episode.